Hey folks, welcome to Lawfare Live's morning briefing. This morning, it is uh, maybe the last day of the impeachment trial. It may not be. We don't know. Ooh, very good Edvard Munch face, David. We'll do that again. <laughs> That's good. I need a screenshot. Wait, one more time. I need a screenshot of that. Oh, God. Um, For tweeting. Oh, whoops. Uh, hang on. Sorry. I'll get it later. Uh, we are uh, here with David Priest, whom you know, and Tia Sewell, whom you do not know. Let me introduce Tia. Tia is our uh, redoubtable intern uh, who has uh, been doing uh, a lot of the summarizing uh, of the proceedings uh, for us. And I have been integrating her summaries into my daily diary uh, uh, which she now shares a byline on. She is a uh, student at Stanford University and has the distinction of being the person who has interned for lawfare the longest without ever meeting any of us in person. This is, we call this the, the COVID distinction. Um, <laughs> so uh, welcome to the uh, to Lawfare uh, Live's morning briefing. Um, so we're going to do something a little bit different today, which is we're going to spend a little bit more time up front on the forward looking aspect, because there are some actual significant questions in play that are probably going to be decided this morning or this afternoon. Um, and so uh, we will take a little time to do that before we go to your questions. Um, but before that, Tia, uh, give us uh, your uh, summary of what happened yesterday, what the president's big defense happened, uh, how'd they do? Yeah, um, I mean, I guess the first thing to know is really that the presentation was quite short. They only used three of the 16 hours that they had to make their arguments. Um, and a lot of this time was spent, frankly, playing video montages of prominent Democrat politicians saying things that were designed to make the impeachment trial look hypocritical. Um, and so throughout the day, Trump's lawyers basically base their arguments around a few points. Um, and these points are often, as I said, illustrated by those video compilations. Um, one of these is that simply Trump was not responsible in any way for the violence that occurred on January 6th, according to his lawyers. And they question whether the violence at the Capitol can even really be considered insurrection. Um, they claim that it's a politically charged and entirely baseless um, trial against the president and they call it actually can constitutional cancel culture um so getting our cancel culture buzzword in um and basically they say that democrats have been perfectly fine with violent rioting in the past and that the only difference now is that the president has different political views than they do um, and they use videos of black lives matter protests and subsequent politician responses from last summer contrasting images of fire with um, Pelosi or Schumer saying neutral or positive things about the protests and the protesters. Um, and the defense basically consistently uses those videos to make the point that building off of all of that, Trump is actually the most pro-police, anti-mob rule president in US history. Um, and that's almost a direct quote from um, Trump's lawyer, Castor. Um, and yeah, I guess the point there being a law and order president like Trump would never incite violence, according to his defense team, um, let alone the insurrection at the Capitol that we saw on January 6th. Um, and then they also make the point that with all of that being said, the House impeachment manager's case is fraudulent and manipulated. They show full clips of Trump speaking and claim that his words have been taken out of context. For example, when Trump is quoted for saying fight like hell, he also told protesters to be peaceful and patriotic, they say, and they contrast this fighting rhetoric with a 10 minute montage of Democrat politicians also saying fight um, in their own speeches. Um, and they also claim that the First Amendment arguments are wrong on the facts. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I would say that's that marks it by my call, but. You left one thing out Excellent. of your um, coverage of the video montage, which is Democratic politicians, yes, but also Madonna and Johnny Depp, which oh, yeah. was an odd choice. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think actually we should give the impeachment uh, defense credit for one critical point that they established, 
which is that, uh, yes, democratic politicians have, in fact, frequently used the word fight. Yes. Established. I, I think they... Yeah. Like, if the article of impeachment had right. been Donald J. Trump used the word fight and in a fashion that nobody else ever has, right? Uh, he would be acquitted um, and should yeah. be acquitted because they have proved that Elizabeth Warren herself has used the word fight many, many times. Um, David, what are your thoughts from yesterday? Uh, so I, yeah. uh, I want to set this up um, uh, provocatively. David Frum describes this in The Atlantic this morning as the culmination of four years of the incompetence of the Trump administration. Um, I think that the president's lawyers actually did a better job than they are getting credit for. They are being panned. Uh, and I will explain my reasoning for that uh, momentarily. But I'm curious, whose side are you on on that? Did, was this an embarrassing presentation by the president's lawyers? Or was it reasonably able given the circumstances that they faced? I, I actually think it's both, Ben. I think that they did not address the merits of the case in a way that a, I don't know how to say this, but perhaps a more experienced constitutional lawyer would have. Um, Van Der Veen is a personal injury lawyer and it showed. Um, I got to teach the word odious to my young son to describe the way he spoke, the venom with which he pronounced words. You know, how do you describe somebody who's a little bit of Snape and a whole lot of Malfoy? Um, and the word <laughs> odious came to mind. Um, so I think that they definitely could have done better on the merits of the, the case on the actual House impeachment manager's arguments. But that is not their goal. Their goal is to speak to really the Trump base um, and through them to speak to the senators. Yes, they're speaking directly to the senators, um, but the senators are responsive to their base. They're not afraid of Trump. They're afraid of Trump voters. And this was a case that was red meat for the Trump voters. And it actually accomplished its purpose there. It did a very good job of the whataboutism becoming reality and pointing out, you have Kamala Harris up there joking about somebody dying if she's in a ring with Republicans. Um, that gives people the fig leaf they need. And that was the purpose yes. of that presentation yesterday. That So we can sit here and argue the merits and the objective reality of their fact, um, their fact basis and their questioning of the impeachment manager's fact basis. That's not it. That's not what they were trying to do. Yeah, so I I agree with that. I do not think it was a great presentation. And, you know, a truly great trial lawyer takes a terrible hand and plays it really well. And I don't think they did that. Um, and by the way, when you watch that happen, that is a thing of evil beauty to, to see. It's a it's a it's a remarkable thing. Um, I don't think they succeeded at that, but they had an exceptionally weak hand and they have only bad arguments available to them. And um, I thought they made one grand strategic error, which was they really underplayed the this was pre-planned uh, so Trump couldn't right. have incited it aspect. I think that's their strongest argument. They did make it. Uh, I would have spent 80% of the time on that argument if I had been in their shoes. Um, I think you're right that that is their, their strongest argument, but the counter argument would have been so easy that I wonder if they didn't want to even go there. The counter argument being, okay, then it's not all about that speech. Let us reinforce our stronger case as house impeachment managers, which they should have of the long trail of weeks and months of building okay. up to that. But 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 here's the thing. If you argue, so this is where the drafting of the impeachment article uh, actually matters. The impeachment article doesn't talk about those weeks and months, yeah. and it doesn't talk about the uh, dereliction of duty uh, once the attack had started. It's simply not in there. It talks, it mentions Brad Raffensperger, 
but it doesn't mention the you know setting up the entire uh, 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 environment in which this takes place. And I think that is a you know if if Raskin and company made one great error, it was in the drafting of the thing. So I think their best the best argument available to them is one. The House managers have prosecuted a different case from the case that they charged in the impeachment article. The impeachment article doesn't address the big lie. It doesn't address the hundreds of tweets that Donald Trump sent leading up to this. And it doesn't address his handling. They could have charged dereliction of duty in connection with his handling of the uh, uh, riot, but that's not what they charge. It's literally not mentioned in there. What they charged is that he incited the riot with his speech. Yep. And let us prove to you that that didn't happen because these people came to Washington preparing to do this. They planted bombs the night before. They, right? Like, like you could actually make that work as a case. I don't think they did that. That said, I do not think their presentation was embarrassing for the reason that you just described. Their job is to give Ron Johnson uh, a fig leaf and to give a bunch of other people a fig leaf, to give them some talking points. They did that. Um, and they're going to win. Um, yeah. And they're going to win. And by the way, they lied a whole lot less than Trump normally does. Um, and so I think in a basic way, they kind of did their job. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts, Tia? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's kind of exactly right. These these lawyers knew that that argument was there and they did talk about it. They did show, you know, like these images of, you know, TV screenshots in which people were talking about it being premeditated. The FBI, Department of Justice, both confirmed as well that this was um, this was in the works before January 6th itself. And so I think that that was there, but I think you're right in that this was in a way politically strategic for them. They are making an argument for Republican senators to, to be able to say, this is constitutional cancel culture. And, you know, this is an effort to censor the president and punish the president. Um, and I don't necessarily know that the goal was to lay out a strong argument in as much as it was to convince um, the president's political base that this is really an attempt to override. Whoops, we've lost, Tia's frozen. Uh, David, um, uh, give us your sense of what is going to happen today. There is some, uh, I think there are some genuine issues that are in play right now. Um, yeah. How do you game out what's going to happen starting in 45 minutes? Yeah, the, the big question remaining is, will the impeachment managers um, move to have witnesses? And then there will be a debate on that and then a vote on whether there will be any witnesses. Uh, or perhaps a particular witness. But that may not even happen today, it depends. Uh, we're scheduled to have two hours of closing arguments, I believe, from each side. Um, because it's a Saturday, they may decide that's a full day and they'll just come back another day. Or after those arguments, maybe then there's some motion. There could be a surprise motion from Schumer or McConnell, although I doubt it. On the issue of witnesses, I think we, we've talked a lot about that in recent days, but, I see a little bit more chance, still a low chance, but a little bit more chance for a move for witnesses simply because the defense talked several times about how rushed this case was, about how the evidence base wasn't developed, how they pushed this through, how could we possibly debate this? And that's that's almost a dangling to Raskin to say, okay, um, you know, let's try to get Tuberville or Pence or somebody sitting here explaining the very thing that you're questioning that we don't know enough on. I still think it's a, I, I still think it's improbable, um, but there's a possibility of that. Of course, if they do the two hours of speechifying to close the arguments, uh, the defense case, it's going to sound a lot like it did yesterday, because as Tia noted, it was around three hours. Uh, I don't think they'll take the full two hours because they're not going to show all the videos again and they don't have much else to say. 
it's possible that they could then move to the vote. And if you recall from a year ago, senators were allowed to make speeches to explain their votes. Mitt Romney's probably got the most attention from that process, but you could have senators speaking before any vote, which could delay that, push it into the night or again to another day. Yeah, I think there, there, there's a real interesting witness question that arises this morning. And the reason is, number one, uh, that, you know, there's actually a series of contested issues of fact here. Um, what the president did, and this really came out in the Q&A yesterday um, when uh, I forget which senator, Tio will remember, um, said that, asked whether the president really uh, uh, abandoned Mike Pence. Um, and, you know, the answers were from the um, House managers, yep, sure did. And from the, uh, the defense side, of course not. He would never do that. Right. And, and, you know, there's actually somebody who knows the answer to this question, and it is Mike Pence. And, and I, I can't imagine that somebody in the Senate is not scratching their head and saying, why are we leaving this question unresolved? There's about 10 questions like that. Um, uh, um, and, you know, I, I think like there has to be a decision whether you're going to just ignore those questions and resolve this on the basis of sort of ipsy dixit arguments from both sides or whether you're going to try to resolve them um and then we should we... note for everybody that if there are witnesses this will not be the dramatic um you know movie or tv scene where suddenly mike pence is ushered in and sits in the senate in front of all the senators they, they will take his testimony or a deposition separately while the Senate conducts other business. Uh, they're not likely to have him standing there doing uh, a live back and forth and cross-examination. That's not the procedures the way they're set up. That's right, and that's a good thing, actually, as as people will remember from the House impeachment uh, hearings, uh, the almost all of the valuable information. I mean, the showmanship associated with the live testimony of Alex Vindman and Fiona Hill and, uh, you know, uh, Masha uh, Yovanovitch was really compelling, but the really valuable information was elicited in these private depositions. And if you want to spend quality time as a, as a trial lawyer with Mike Pence, you really do want to do it in a, in a closed room. Pauline, the floor is yours. All right. You guys pretty much covered my initial question, which was uh, the likelihood of getting uh, witnesses rather than just closing the whole thing off today. And uh, but uh, well, what so so can I say yeah. that the I I think the likelihood is low, but mm -hmm. I also think it matters how the matter is presented and by whom. Yeah. And so and there are some important things to watch in this. So one is if there is a motion for witnesses, who does it come from? Mm -hmm. Right. Does it come from like it's very different if it comes from Bill Cassidy, you know, who who seems to actually be struggling with how he's going to vote on conviction. Um then like then it's like, OK, well, who's going to deny a wavering senator his ability to to vote? And that actually suggests that a vote, you know, votes are in play. Then if it comes from a Democrat who's merely trying to amplify the record to embarrass Republicans. Um, I also think, you know, the extreme case to watch for is, you know, what does Mitch McConnell do in response to a vote to hear a motion to hear witnesses? If he votes to hear from people, that's a you know, that's a tell as to how he's thinking. Uh, and so I think the witness question is going to be super interesting. I think the likelihood that it it happens is remote, but I do think it'll be a very interesting window into how people are thinking hey, sorry um, i cut you off no 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 that's fine um also what you said about the uh 
the way it, the uh, impeachment article was framed was interesting because I hadn't thought of that. Did they, is, did they make a mistake in framing it that narrowly? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but now, now, to be fair, um, that, but to look, to be fair to them, the, Repu the, the president's counsel have not made right. anything of this. Right. But, um, be, and, and, you know, but I think you could have built a defense around the inadequacies of the article that the and, and I, by the way, as David will back me up, I started complaining about the way the de the article was drafted the day the text became public. The minute and, it became public, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it like I I think I, I don't want to be too hard on the, the managers about this. You know, for Christ's sake, Jamie lost his son. He went through this incredibly traumatic day mm. where he he really thought his you know his other kids might be in danger, um, yeah. and he drafts an impeachment article in the middle of this, right? Yeah, and I have no idea I, how he could do that. I, yeah. I, I don't I don't want to be too <laughs> critical of it. I mean, it's an like he's run an incredible show here, and I got to say, there's a lot of. I'm not as harsh on the article uh, as you are, Ben, because I think the elements are still there. Doesn't it still make reference to fulfilling his oath of office? And, you know, the, the impeachment article is not the legal brief. The impeachment article need not have all of the elements in it. I think it would have been wise to have three impeachment articles here, one on attempting to influence the election when he knew that it was unconstitutional to do so, which builds up to this event of January 6th one on the actual speech and incitement on January 6th, and one specifically on dereliction of duty for yeah. not taking action. I think three articles would have been fine. You definitely would have had people rejecting one of or more of those three for various reasons. You could have easily seen somebody rejecting the first one on the Republican side because they actually didn't agree that what Trump was doing was unconstitutional because the election was stolen. Okay, fine. But that way, you actually give people an easier time voting for one of them. So I think that's exactly right. Um, and look, if you had three articles, you could say, hey, the first article, setting up the circumstances, means exercising his right to challenge an election, and I'm not going to vote for that. Uh, the remedy for that is that 61 courts rejected it. He lost. Um Incitement, I'm not going to accept it because, you know, incitement is a term of art and the speech was, you know, it was a bad speech, but I don't think it actually caused the riot, right? Number three, dereliction of duty in response to the riot. There is no defense, yeah. right? Like, people are storming the Capitol and he did nothing and no one has argued that he did anything. And so I think the merits of those are actually slightly different. And if you disaggregate them, it becomes extremely difficult to defend him on that third point. Now, I would convict him on the first two as well, but I'm not Bill Cassidy. And I think if you're trying to... Um, if you're if if you had if you had developed this the way a trial team would actually normally behave, David's point that you would disaggregate these is exactly right. I don't want to be too hard on them. They did it in haste. They were not wrong to do it in haste. It's not a good article, just as a as a um, as a matter of what of the relationship between the charge and the litigation. David Botts, the floor is yours. Thanks. Good morning. Um, interested in your thoughts. Is it probable that defense counsel will be investigated or sanctioned for telling lies? And what what would actually be the result of that? And does that tease a little bit on the witness uh, question as well? Thank you. Ben, that's probably yours. Yeah, there is. I don't think they are. Look, they are... Uh, your job as a defense lawyer in a case with a, uh, a guilty client, and that's what this is, uh, is to throw up smoke and use a whole lot of bluster. And you're not allowed to say things that are literally untrue. 
but your job is to throw smoke in the air and 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 obfuscate the truth. And uh, you have a ethical obligation zealously to represent your client's interest at the expense of your own integrity, if you have to. Uh, and that's what these lawyers are doing. And I, I do not actually fault them for the gross, nasty, uh, you know, sort of disgustingness of their presentation. I, I fault Donald Trump for it. I um, would add. Yeah, go ahead, Tia. I was going to say, I would add to that. I think it's interesting to think about, um, you know, Senator Sanders had a question where he asked, basically, did Trump win the 2020 election? And of course, Plaskett for the managers says yes or no, like, um, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Biden won the 2020 election. But Vanderveen answers for the defense and is quite defensive about the question in general, but states that his judgment is irrelevant and refuses to actually give an answer because he doesn't want to lie to that extent. And so I think <laughs> yeah. that's an interesting point to that end. I'm a bit surprised I that there right. were more when, questions like that. When I, was I, when I more than 28. When I said they lie, they lied, what I mean is that they, you know, nipped and tucked on a whole lot of video to misrepresent what people said, the relationship to violence, the, um, uh, and, you know, that is standard dishonest lawyering um, of precisely the type that, frankly, they should be engaged in. And um, I don't, uh, I, I don't want to, I, I actually, I don't think they did anything wrong yesterday at, a, at an ethical or, or, uh, I mean, I, as I said before, I have some strategic uh, uh, quibbles with what they did, but I think their presentation was better than a lot of people think it is. Christopher Argyris, you get the last question today. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, hi, all. Um, I would like to game out the, the, the prospect of calling witnesses who, are, who then uh, fight a subpoena in court. What are the mechanics of suspending the trial while while a court challenge is is worked out would would result would would that have to be something that schumer and mcconnell had had agreed to at the beginning of of the of the trial in terms of like whether a, a, the trial can be suspended by by just a simple majority vote um or how, how does that work and what would you see as the prospects for for, for doing that saying you said we haven't proved our, our case, but we have we want to get these witnesses who could prove our case. So therefore, we're, we're not going to uh, go to a final judgment until we've heard from these witnesses. David, do you want to take that or should I? Um, I'll go quickly and set you up for the, the longer answer. Um, briefly, I think the Senate can easily suspend what's going on while they do that. Um, but they will not want to do that for a long period of time. That is, we saw it yesterday, if you watched, you saw that um, Senator Schumer returned the Senate to legislative business to quickly get unanimous consent for a medal for Eugene Goodman. Um, they, 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 that was a suspension of the trial temporarily. Um, they could do that again while they tried to pursue witnesses. Ben. Um, I think uh, there is not a substantial question of their ability to uh, acquire witnesses. So, um, first of all, the um, they have the authority to send the sergeant at arms to compel the witness's presence. So it's not like the house where you basically end up in this. Uh, so if they try to call Mike Pence and Mike Pence doesn't want to show up, uh, they can make him show up. Uh, now, if he wants to resist it, he would have to go into court and uh, file a motion to suppress, to quash the subpoena. The burden would be on him to do that. Um, and I, first of all, don't think he's likely to do that. But secondly, I don't think any district court is likely to tell the Senate of the United States sitting as a trial of impeachment that it can't call a germane witness. And I think the likelihood that that gets resolved very quickly, like emergency motion to quash rejected, uh, is pretty low. So I think, and you know, if they were to subpoena Brad Raffensperger, he'd get on a plane and show up. So I, I, 
I actually don't think there's much question as to their ability to do this. Now, is it different if it's Mark Meadows? Maybe. Uh, does a does a is a court going to prevent Mark Meadows from having to testify? No chance. No chance. Um, we're going to leave it there. The Senate resumes in half an hour. And we will be back tomorrow if and only if things don't resolve today. Um, if, they, if, 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 the, if there's still a proceeding going on tomorrow, we will be back tomorrow, uh, either at 11 o'clock or whenever it wraps up. If not, we will not. And we'll let you know when, uh, when we know. Thanks all for showing up.